Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for this, uh, one of a series of workshops on the new AMEV violin syllabus. My name is Stephen Hodgson, and I'm the head of publishing at AMEV. And very shortly, Julie Hewison, the level one consultant for the AMEB Violin Syllabus Review Project, will be workshopping the level one, that is preliminary through to grade four, uh, repertoire with a particular focus on the new violin series 10 grade books. That's preliminary through to grade four for violin series 10. As part of the violin syllabus and publications team, Julie had primary responsibility for the selection of the level one repertoire, as well as editing the works in the new level one grade books. Uh, however, all members of the syllabus and publications committee had input into the final selection for both the books and the manual lists. Um, so as well as thanking Julie Hewison, level one consultant, I'd like to thank uh, Karan Chan, the level two consultant, Finton Murphy, the level three consultant, and Philippa Page, uh, the principal consultant for the project who really had responsibility for making sure that all of all levels uh, of the syllabus remained coherent uh, and, and flowed beautifully from one level to the next. During this workshop, Julie will take you through each of the grade books from preliminary through to grade four. Um, if you have a copy of the books already, uh, it's probably a good idea to have them ready open um, as Julie will be discussing details of the pieces throughout the session uh, and we're unable to put the, the sheet music up on the screen uh, for copyright reasons. Um, if you have any questions throughout the course of the workshop, please feel free to type them into the chat at the bottom of your Zoom window and we'll do our very best uh, to answer them either during the course of the workshop if possible or at the end if time permits. Finally, at the conclusion of the workshop, I'll take a talk a little bit about a very exciting competition uh, that's been launched by AMEB with our very generous competition partner, Glanville & Co. Now, throughout the workshop, there will be a number of demonstrations, particularly of the new works by Australian composers. Um, I'd like to thank our wonderful performers for these demonstrations, Zoe Black and Joe Kendamo, as well as Monica Kuro and Stefan Casamenos for these beautiful uh, demonstrations of the repertoire. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our level one consultant, Julie Hewison. Uh, well known in Victoria, both as a player and teacher, Julie has performed regularly on the Baroque violin and viola, having studied in London with Catherine McIntosh and Michaela Converti. While living overseas, she appeared with various ensembles, including the Academy of Ancient Music and the English Bach Festival Orchestra, touring to Spain, Greece, France and the Netherlands. In Australia, she has appeared with the Elysium Ensemble, Melbourne, Melbourne Collegium, Capelli Corelli, La Romanesca and Scholar Cantorum, recording a number of CDs, including for the ABC Classic label. Julie has also performed at the Melbourne International Arts Festival, the Brossa Music Festival, the, music, uh, the Melbourne International Festival of Organ and Harpsichord, the Castle Main Festival, the Melbourne Early Music Festival and the Ballarat Organs of the Goldfield Festival. Uh, Julie is a dedicated teacher, having worked in London with Sheila Nelson on the Tower Hamlets project. She's taught Baroque violin at the University of Melbourne and has also lectured in string pedagogy at both the University of Melbourne and Monash University. Uh, Julie has been involved as a conductor and tutor at various music camps, including State Music Camp and Melbourne Youth Music's Summer School. Uh, and in 2004, Julie gave a workshop in Shaman as a guest of the Chinese Music Teachers Association. In March 2013, she was the guest uh, conductor of the Southeast Asia Honor Orchestra and Choir Festival held at the American International School in Guangzhou, China. Uh, welcome, Hughes, uh, Julie. I'm very happy to pass over to you to, uh, to take us through this wonderful repertoire. Okay, thank you, Steve, so much for that introduction. Now, yes, yeah, so we're going to get started, everybody. And first of all, I'd say my aim in getting the pieces for the new books was to present pieces that are appealing to students, musically interesting and also educationally sound and fulfilling the objectives outlined by the AMEB. I've taught for many years and all sorts of children and I've 
realised over this time that the key to engaging children is to have really good repertoire. So repertoire is so important. Exercises are one thing, scales are one thing, but what really gets kids going are pieces. So I've hoped to cho choose pieces that kids will like. Learning a string instrument is challenging and at level one, there needs to be every effort made to create a sense of enjoyment while developing a sound technique to arrive at a good outcome for both teacher and student. As I introduce each step of the syllabus, I will attempt to explain the music and technical approaches to explore this, enabling what I hope should be the best outcome and we get a good result. Um, the objectives appear on page 124 of the current syllabus and they're key to developing a fundamental grand, um, grounding on the instrument. I'm going to attempt to summarise these elements. So balanced posture, right left hand setup, accurate pitch, bow division and ease with the bow strokes, tonal awareness, dynamics um, and rhythmic control. So developing the technical and musical foundations has underpinned my choices. And I hope you can see how they relate to the technical work that um, been, has been done by Philippa. Now, um, so preliminary, I would say, is quite a sophisticated and level. And it presupposes that the student is playing with many skills well on the way to being well developed. The teacher will have had the challenges of establishing a good posture, really good setup, um, developing a clear sense of pitch and rhythm, bow control and reading skills. Now all of these things are presupposed when you get to preliminary. So there are many ways of approaching this and many methods that we've got. And hopefully um, you've had at least one or two years with all one of those beginner methods or a number of things, you usually develop your own ideas too and then we're ready to start preliminary. Okay, so if you've got your books open, that'd be great. And if you don't, that's okay. I'd say the first thing you will have noticed with the new books is the performance notes. So at the bottom of each piece, I've written some performance notes and I hope these help you in preparing the student. I think it's always important to first of all, Look at a piece yourself as a teacher and think, well, what am I going to do with a student? How am I going to introduce this? One thing you can do is say, so if we look at the first piece, Flash of Lightning, I'd say, okay, we're in A major, so let's play an A major scale. Always start with the scale. And then the next thing I can see there, and you can ask the ch child to look at this too, is find the harmonics. You know, what's a harmonic? And hopefully they've looked at the harmonics which are in the exercise as well. This piece, Flesh of Lightning, um, has the rhythm ta, ti, ti, ta, and this relates to Flash of Lightning. And both um, this piece and the next piece, that's how it goes, the rhythm of the title is in the music. So I think it's important to impress that on the child, especially when they're doing a slightly more complex rhythm. So. In that's how it goes. The second piece we've got that's how it goes, which is in bar two. So you can practice those rhythms on open strings. Uh, always a good way to go. Um, that's how it goes. There's also good string crossing here, and it's very important to get that elbow level when you're working with a young student, making sure that the shoulder's really free. And exercise PC, you can see we've got that string crossing going on too. So really make sure that the arm levels, shoulders are really free, the elbow knows how to rest on each string at the different level. Now, if we turn over, we get to uh, the next piece, running for the bus with the violin. This is perhaps a little bit more extending. So when I've chosen the pieces, some of the pieces are a little bit more tricky, but maybe they're the ones that you do a little bit later when you've got um, comfy with the other pieces. Again string crossing here, different patterns and then we've got square dance. So Stanley Fletcher that wrote square dance you'll probably all be familiar with 
stand, oh, you mightn't be, but Paul Rowland was a very famous American educator and had some books written by Stanley Fletcher, some pieces written for his project in Illinois, and they're really educationally excellent pieces. And so square dance, and again, here we've got duet forms, so you can play along with your student. Now, the next piece, if we're looking at this B, so this B are usually calmer, smoother pieces, and I would like to, we've got a recording of this, which is fantastic. And this is written by Emma Greenhill, and she's from Sydney. And uh, I think it's a very atmospheric. And... Yes, that was wonderful. Now, hopefully your students will be playing as well as that by the time they get to the exam. Now, um, the next piece in this book is the Enchanted Forest. So I'd just like to mention another aspect of teaching young children, which I would encourage, and I hope that the pieces that I've included will encourage you to think about them to start writing stories about what they're playing. Enchanted forest, you can ask them what that means. Um, the same with desert rain, talk about the desert. And I always find that if children have a picture in their head of what they're playing about at this level, it really helps. So I encourage you to do that with these pieces. Um, now the last piece in the book is Starry Night. And this is by um, our Melbourne composer, Eugenie Tachinet. And she's written some lovely books, possum books, um, about beginning violin playing. And we could listen now to Starry Night. <laughs> Thanks, a lovely, another lovely performance. Now, I'll just quickly look at list C. Um, list C, I've got a few dancers again, and Alenki and Polka. And these are two of my very favorite pieces. 
I love um, a rhythm where you've got a strong rhythm. So, and then you move from crossing the string, ti ti ta, ti ti ta, then ticka ticka ti ti. Um, so, Bohemia Polka, make sure again you've got these arm levels crossing and the fingers are nice and flexible. Bohemia Polka playing on the old banjo. So, we've got a little bit of American stuff happening. 10,000 miles away, of course, one of our um, folk songs from Australia and another violin part so the teacher can play along. Now, um, with a linky, you've got another upbeat. Great dynamic changes. And I think talking about dynamics, what I often find when I'm examining at this level, dynamics just don't exist. So it's really important to start talking about dynamics with your students. So especially in a lengthy MF we start, we go to piano, forte, piano. The piano is matched with slurred bowing. And so you can talk about being a little bit more sensitive here, a bit more gentle, and then the forte really strong. So you can start doing uh, dynamic practice, even on scale, start play a scale loudly, play a scale softly, maybe play it with a crescendo going through to the end. So I'd encourage you to think about dynamics at this level. So I think that wraps up preliminary for the moment. And now we'll move on to grade one. So I'm just going to get my grade one book ready. Okay, so here's grade one. Now, when we get to grade one, just before we talk about it, I'd like to just talk about repertoire exams for a moment because they're growing in popularity, especially after the last couple of years and all we've had to face. Um, I would really like to suggest that when people do a repertoire exam, even though you don't have to be examined on the technical work, I would encourage you to cover the technical work. Get your students to buy the technical work and go through it because you can't play pieces, as we all know, complex pieces without a basically good technique. And we've all had students who want to play Michael Jackson but can't play a down bow to save themselves. So I would encourage you to work on the repertoire, even if you're not presenting it for an exam, work on the technique, I'm sorry. As well, I think when you look at a piece, you need to prepare it if you're not going to be doing the technical work and need to look at the scale, look at the main rhythmic patterns and the main finger patterns so that the, the student is well prepared before they start a piece. Now let's move to grade one. So grade one we've now got harmonic minor patterns coming in, B flat major. Now I must say that I find it's quite challenging for young students to play with a low first finger they get a little bit squashed, especially on the E string with their F natural. So make sure that you do quite a lot of practice of just getting them to stretch that first finger back and forth. So there, and that their wrist's nice and straight. There's a lot of collapsed wrist still happening at preliminary. So make sure that, you know, you get this idea of the straight wrist and the fingers being able to move independently for all things. Okay, uh, we've also got some stopped staccato starting to happen and some easy double stops. So these things are occurring in the technical work and I hope I've been able to include them in the pieces. Now, so if we have a look at the first one, Overture and Beginners, um, you can see that there's a little bit of change here from Arco to Pitts in the second part. And you can show your um, students how to do that how to hold their bow and extend their first finger. And I often still get them to anchor their thumb onto the corner of the fingerboard, which hopefully with the rest you've got time to do. If we have a look at the second piece here in grade one, we've got um, do that special. So again, this lovely repeated detache. I'm hoping by this stage that Opening from the elbow and at ease with basic detache stroke is really starting to take place. And of course, you can practice that on your double stops. Oh, sorry, I mean on your scales. Now, after um, Dude Ranch Special, we've got bagpipes and kilts. 
Um, so this is by an American composer, Soon He Newbold, who's written some really interesting ensemble pieces as well. And the bagpipe section with the open string double stops in the middle is a really, you know, a time to practice the double stops. Talk about the different levels again, like you've got E, A, D, G, but you've also got those levels of the arm in between to make sure they can uh, play both strings at once. Yep, and it's, then we've got a rather knees up sort of Scottish tune happening here. The last one here is the Salty Sailor's Song by Keith Sharp, who of course is our wonderful Keith Sharp from Queensland. And he also writes, this was a read, um, written for the violin with the, with the um, teacher can play the, the underneath part, the duet part. I would like you just always, another thing to do is to remember when they, sometimes when I'm examining, people only use about this much of bow, even though they've got a whole long bow. When you get to bar 19 in this piece with the three accented E's, make sure that stretching out and doing whole bows, start encouraging young students to really use a whole bow when needed and to have that difference between a whole bow and a smaller stroke. Okay, now we're going to move into list B now. Now with list B, again, gentler, smoother bows and starting to create a, perhaps a more sensitive musical awareness here. I'd like to mention um, that I've chosen two waltzes, waltzes being, you know, three beats in a bar. And it's very natural for young students to be much more comfortable with duple time. So, I think encouraging them to play in a three, four from the beginning is good. And these waltzes get that feeling of them going one, two, three, one, two, three. You can even hold their hands and go left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. So they feel that lilting quality of a waltz. The Empress Waltz is the other waltz in the list B section, number four. It's a much more challenging piece for the bowing especially. Um, but so the grand vault's brilliant. I'd start with that one first of all. And then if you've got a more advanced student, the Empress Waltz is a good one. Now we have a recording for one of our list B pieces too. We've got the Old City um, from Karen Kiriakou um, from Melbourne. That's great. I mean, it's such a lovely piece. Um, my students have really enjoyed playing that piece. Now we're going to move to list C. So with list C, we always have fun pieces in list C. And 
I couldn't resist putting in the Adams family. I love this tune. And as there was a film, new film version in 2019, 2021, I looked up and there's been a second um, one made as well. They still use this theme, which is unbelievable. So every kid knows this and you can go back and look at the originals and, you know, even their parents can relate to it. So it also introduces triplets with their da 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 dum and and then the stamp stamp. So you can really get into the rhythm of this one. And it introduces high three, the D sharp, which you know relates to the technical work that we've been doing in the A harmonic minor. Uh, so that's another good aspect of this educationally. Bar 10, you've got the bowing where you end a phrase on an up bow, but then have to start the new phrase with an up bow again. So stopping the bow, that's a technique that first happened in the preliminary level, really. The train stops, it was called at one point. So make sure you practice that so that they, they don't use all their bow up. It's not a retake, it's just stopping the bow and then continuing with another up bow. Um, another piece I'd like to mention in here is Ala Turka. Now, um, in the Turkish style, this was recommended to me by a colleague who worked at a boys' school, and he said the boys absolutely love it, and I find my girls love it too. Um, it's a really strong march, this Ala Turka. Uh, the rhythm in bar 25, one of my favourites, where you go down, up, and absolutely extend the up bow. I call it a whoosh bow, but really good to get kids to be moving very freely with big movements when they are playing as well as tiny movements they can get a little bit constrained so really enjoy that bar 25. Now we have another piece to listen to and another wonderful Australian composer you can see we've got lots of lovely pieces by Australians in here which is good. Um, the King's Fiddlers. Now, I, I was just going to say that Keith Sharp originally wrote this piece for Ensemble, and when I was teaching at school, um, absolutely, this was so popular. It's a really fun piece to play. So you can enjoy um, King's Fiddlers. Now, moving on to Grade 2. So, when we look at Grade 2, I'm just going to flip to my Again, really worthwhile having a look at the challenges. I think grade two is actually quite a big jump in some ways. We've got starting to work in third position and we've got B flat major again, two octaves G. We've got melodic minor and the third position scales of D major. So they're all quite um, new things to be approaching as a violinist. So when you are getting to grade two, hopefully everybody's got their basic strokes organised and they're ready to start um, moving up the fiddle. With the um, harmonic movement that you, the children have been doing, they should be really comfy with finding how to get up high and sliding. And of course, don't forget that the thumb has got to move up too. Um, I would spend quite a bit of time talking about octaves, like low D, open D, third position D with your first finger and just hearing that octave and moving up to find that before you start on the scales and on the demands of the pieces in third position. So um, now the other thing in ninth flight we've got this semiquaver stroke so um, because there's so many semiquavers I, I always want how did they count how many they've got have them to have that rhythmic feel of ticker, 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 ticker. So they're subdividing their Ds and feeling the beats in groups of four and not too much bow at all being used here. The um, tremolo at the end is another fun thing for them to start to do. And I put that up bow um, in the last bar because I think if you're tremoloing and you do a forte piano tremolo down to the point and then a nice whooshy up bow, my favourite stroke, and then a left hand pitch. So just a little bit of coordination needed here to get that happening. But So it's a bit more demanding than what's going on now in grade two. Pieces of course getting more fun and they're, because they're more able to play them. Now after night flight, the next piece that we have uh, the aria. 
Yeah, this, this I'm, I originally was looking at the repertoire from Colour Strings and they use quite a lot of classical pieces, but the, um, this piece I think is quite a good one for all the semi-quaver movement, introducing us to this idea, this Baroque idea, lots of broken thirds and running little sequences. Hard Rock Cafe, all in third position. So I would recommend, and this is very good for D minor scale, uh, because you've got a minor third with that finger pattern of one, two, three, four. <clears throat> and you have to do that on every string in this piece. So third position for the Hard Rock Cafe. Now, um, after the list A for grade two, we're moving over to list B. And the list B pieces. Now, smoother and slower, um, more advanced slurs. The bow stroke, um, yep, yeah, I'm just going to show you what I would like you to get. You can see when we're watching Zoe, we see this very beautiful flexible wrist. So I'd like people at grade two to be starting to think about, you can use scarves, um, you can use all sorts of things to get them feeling about moving paintbrush. Sheila Nelson used to say paintbrush to get them to start having a little bit of movement in their wrist, a little bit of flexibility would be, is a good idea by this time, especially for these slower, more, more legato pieces. Um, okay, now we've got some classics here. Uh, Dance the Blessed Spirits on Wings of Song. When you get to the introduction and theme of Paganini, this is um, arranged by Paul Herforth, and I think that's how you say it. Um, and if you remember, he was the one who wrote Tune a Day, and Tune a Day was perhaps, he, I was looking up and he was born in 1893. So he was one of the first, he was an American violin teacher and one of the first people to have beginner methods for people to learn the violin with. So, and he wrote them for all the instruments. So he's very well known. And he, of course, used to, a well known, um, a taking a famous piece and then making it accessible to children. So this Les Strege, which means the witches. So if they have a listen to that, there's some great recordings on YouTube now. How lucky are we to have YouTube and to have Spotify, but especially on YouTube, because you can watch people playing as well. And this is his um, con his children's version of this piece that was written as a very elaborate piece by Paganini for an advanced violinist. I included the introduction because I think that, you know, getting that slow feeling and then the fast dance for the contrast. So as we know, this is a popular Suzuki piece and all from Paganini. And then you can start to talk about Paganini. So good to get them to look up Paganini, tell you as much as they can next week. It's always a good idea. The next piece, Chanson Trice. Now, I'd say this is my absolute top piece for teaching vibrato. It has um, repeated notes, so it's excellent. Now, I know we don't have to do vibrato at grade two, but I think at grade two, Children should be bowing strongly and beautifully. So you can start to talk about, well, let's look at the left hand and let's, you know, just do some basic exercises, polishing on the violin, just on the back of the hand, get them to start feeling their wrist moving and chanson triste if they want to have a go. I have had some students who just by looking at people playing, um, doing some vibrato come back and say, look, um, I'm trying vibrato. As soon as they show an interest, I think it's the time to say, okay, and you can say, well, maybe next week and have a think about, well, yeah, they're ready, but just to start doing some basic exercises. Johnson Trist is a very, very beautiful piece by Tchaikovsky, again, an excellent, beautiful, wonderful composer that you can introduce them to. Now, let's move to list C. So when we get to list C, um, again, alternate styles, we're getting even more variety here. Uh, Viva Italia and Trick or Treat, we've got recordings in a minute. So let's first of all, perhaps have Trick or Treat. Nerida Oostenbroek again, 
and uh, with this rather spooky little number. Great, so that's a really cute little piece. Again, appropriate to talking about stories. And then the next piece, um, let's see number three, Viva Italia, arranged by Loretta Finn. Great, so that's a lot of fun. Um, now, I would like to just make a short reference to the last piece in the book. Again, one of my favorites, Havana Gila. And this piece, I think, first appeared in the Amy B in um, Series 5, but I've always found it a fantastic piece when you're first talking about harmonic minor and that association of the harmonic minor, the top of the harmonic minor scale with Middle Eastern music. And this, of course, is an Israeli song, and I think students really enjoy it. A lot of character going on here, and it's a really strong piece where you've got the double stops in the middle and then uh, a little bit of third position with but a very strong and wonderful piece full of character okay so that wraps up grade two so much to get through and now we're up to grade three and okay so when i'm looking at grade three i'll just open up my book here Now, grade three, yep, here we go. So um, we've got second position introduced here, chromatic scales and hook stroke patterns. There's two hook stroke patterns in the uh, exercises. Yep, the bowing exercise, the last bowing exercise for grade three. And more control of bow speeds too. In that same exercise, you've got it. Um, quick down bow on the first beat and then three beats for the up bow. So more control in the bow is developing, hopefully. Hopefully. Now, um, let's just have a little look at Carnival Parade Rumba. And I just wanted to talk a little bit here about rhythm. And I really enjoy rhythmic pieces. And so this first bar, we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So I would really um, encourage you to enjoy, explore that rhythm with your students. Again, clapping, singing, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. Or else you can use fruit. <laughs> and I often, when I was teaching, would use words for um, rhythm. So you can go pineapple, pineapple, mango, pineapple, pineapple, mango. So I'd encourage you to just muck around with, get them to um, make up their own rhythms, their own fruits, you know, their pets' names, anyone, anything like that. But enjoy exploring the rhythm in that piece. Then we've got um, Moda Perpetua. Now this is um, just an old favourite from Sheila Nelson. And third position, it's all in third position. And I would really encourage you when you're playing in third position just to get that feeling of the elbow being really comfortable up there and the fingers curved. So what I sometimes see when people first start to do third position is that their fingers are quite straight. Make sure you keep that curved shape 
going up and down the fingerboard and bringing your elbow under as you go under a little bit and further up. Okay, and keep it nice and free when you're going um, across the strings. Now, the next um, piece, Herman's Hornpipe, and I just met, this is by Mark O'Connor. Now, he's an interesting American composer, and he's just come out re fairly recently with a series of method books uh, for learning to play the fiddle. So this is from one of those books. And um, I think that there's another one in grade four as well. So he's got lots of string crossing. And you can see here, you've got to be really at, comfortable with a free shoulder and elbow moving to get across the strings pretty quickly. So enjoy Herman's hornpipe with that uh, American fiddle feel. The next piece, I really wanted to include a second position study in C major. We have to do C major as a scale in grade three in second position and second position always neglected. So this piece, you just stay in second position and so they don't have to worry about shifting up and down, but just getting really comfy and it starts with the C major scale, which is really good. So you establish that before you um, go into the rest of the study. So if you're feeling like getting going with second position, that's good. The next study, I'll quickly talk about this one. I, I really enjoy with my older students uh, having, doing, when they do a study, to find the character of the study because you don't want it just to be played in a very boring way. And this study by Wolfhardt has very strong, it's in A minor, so you've got and you've got the bum da dum da dum da 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 da. You've got the strong rhythmic feel at the beginning, of it. and it can be played with quite a lot of attitude. So making the idea of a study not just as a boring thing, but as a really exciting piece. Now, um, list B. So list B starts. The first piece in this B is the very famous humorous by Dvorak. Again. Um, included in the Suzuki repertoire. Now this is also an absolutely wonderful piece for teaching children about different moods and different characters in the same piece. So you've got starting off in D major and then we've got the D minor section. Now this is also bringing into play where we're moving into gypsy pieces that have this strong contrast uh, in their keys and this this middle section in, in D minor, I think you can, a lot of character and a lot of rich tone can be starting to happen. Grade three again, if they're doing a little bit of vibrato, uh, that would be good. So you can talk about getting that happening. All right, now, so that after um, this piece here, we've got, I'd like to talk, just the next piece um, is by Kukla. And Kukla is one of the, a German school of violin teachers. There's reading, Kukla, um, and they wrote lots of these little concertino pieces for their students. And what you'll find is they're in the style, this one's in the style of Vivaldi, but uh, they're often in the style of uh, Baroque stuff. But they're very excellent for sort of, getting that concerto feeling happening. You can talk about concertos, about being soloist and with orchestra, and you can even find um, orchestral arrangements. So if you are teaching at a school, you might think of perhaps getting your little kids to, because the, the um, backing is not too difficult. Sometimes they're a bit boring, those backings, aren't they? Especially for the third violins, but they can really enjoy being a soloist with this piece. and to start to talk about that. Good, so that's um, those pieces by Kukla. Now, um, the next piece, La Cinque Tain, oh, another beautiful piece that has been in the old books of the AMEB, but I just really wanted to include this again because it's so charming and so elegant. And having to play in an elegant way with those lifted bow strokes in that first bar, you know, is a technique that we need to another. We don't always have to play fast and furious, but it's such a beautiful piece, originally for the cello.
Okay, and flexible fingers are needed here too. And again, the change in keys, which um, is nice. And uh, then after that, we've got another waltz. So this, now this waltz from Tchaikovsky, from the serenade for, the very famous serenade for strings. I like pieces that are taken from orchestral pieces and then you can actually play them the serenade and you can say guess what you know we're able to play this piece we're only we might only be you know we're doing grade three but we can play the theme from this beautiful beautiful serenade which they might get to later when they're hopefully in an orchestra <laughs> but yeah so that's the waltz from the serenade for strings now then moving over to list c for grade three and our first piece in this C is Spy Time Rag. And I would again encourage the story idea, especially for children who play like machines. Um, you know, I don't mean that, but you know what I mean. Um, it's really good for them to start to think a little bit more creatively and to start to think, use their imagination, write you a little story. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> So just a little taster of that, and you can hear the ragtime syncopated rhythm happening there as well. And that was a very lively performance of that spy time rag. Now, um, this C, I'd just like to quickly mention the next one, Russian Fantasia. We've had the um, number two, I think, was in the last series. These are wonderful, these books, and they they start us on that journey to gypsy pieces with um, Chartis. I'm Monty, you know, coming up in the next level with the slow introduction and then the faster dance. And especially in this one, you've got the quavers when we get to the allegretto section, and then we've got the rhythm T, ticker, T, ticker, and then we've got six, eight, da, 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 and then the semi quavers at the end. So gradually that build up of speed, which happens in these exciting dances. Finishing off with the large string crossing and I really this is another stroke I really enjoy teaching so when you get to bar 67 make sure that you practice big string crossing so starting on the low string and ending up on the on the E so you go D straight over to E before you play the E so, to, so you practice that large string crossing which is just as important and you, you want to have that nice um, mobility in your shoulder when you're teaching this one. Then we've got La Composita. So this is one of our tangos and starting to move into that Spanish style, which again is a really important part. We're very lucky as violinists because we can play any type of music. There are string violin instruments in all sorts of music and especially that Spanish Argentinian feel. So enjoy this one. Uh, and with the rhythm, um, you've got T, 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 ba, da, da, da. So just getting that, uh, making sure they stop the bow really beautifully on that semi quaver rest because they always want to rush into it. So it's that held feeling of a tango that you want to get happening here. Don't forget the metronome. Um, I always say to them, the metronome is your best friend um, for those children who want to rush all the time. So enjoy the metronome in this one. So they really get the strict tango control of the rhythm. And then the last piece in this grade is Shanghai Hornpipe. And Shanghai Hornpipe, again, um, Keechup originally wrote this as a an, an ensemble piece 
and it's such fun to play. Um, I've always had students love this piece. Especially fun is the, the section starting in 20 and bar 21. You've got the 6, 8 and 4, 4. So the quaver keeps going. So you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And you get that feeling of the change, even though the quaver pulse is continuing, but mixing up the accents and the, the meter. So a lot of fun can be had playing Shanghai Hornpipe. Uh, and it's got a, um, yeah, with its little scale of D, G, A, B, the pentatonic uh, scale coming from Asia, plus you've got the uh, Celtic feel of the jig. So it's a great piece by Keith Sharp, another one we all know from Queensland. Now, so that's grade three. And I think we're now moving on to grade four and we're getting there. We're getting there. I know. Thanks for hanging in. So grade four. Okay. So here we go. Grade four. Just find my, yeah. Now, so I think it's always a terrific achievement for a child to get to grade four. They're usually able to play in an ensemble if they're at school or maybe they're going to you know, Melbourne youth orchestras or they, they can go off to music camp. They can really join in and they should be quite comfortable with most of the bow, basic bow strokes. They can play a little bit in position. So the new thing I think that's really important to be establishing at grade four is vibrato. So I've talked about bringing it in a little bit early, but definitely if you've had a child that it's not happening with, talk about vibrato, start to get working on some basic exercises. There's lots of stuff now available on YouTube that you can look at, which can really help if you're not that comfy teaching it. But, you know, simple polishing things, uh, just getting them to the feel of starting is really good. Also, we've got the three octave G major scale introduced. So that's um, a new thing too. Okay, so it's, and spiccato, yeah, so doing some spiccato bowing. So again, with spiccato bowing, you know, just little smiley bows and right down at the nut, starting them to feel comfortable in their flexible fingers. Okay, now, so the first one here I'd, I'd like to talk about, and this was actually suggested by Karen Chan in Sydney, and this is a fantastic piece, and I gather that Suzuki students are, fairly comfortable. It's not in his repertoire, but they like to play this. It's a lot of fun. And there's a hilarious YouTube with a young child doing it from memory at some sort of um, American cowboy convention or something, but it's a lot of fun. And basic double stops happening there, slides. So you're getting into that um, country sort of way of playing. And some key changes. So enjoy. Um, it's a long piece, so maybe you wouldn't do it for an exam, but yeah, you could, of course, but enjoy playing it, and I think it's fun one. Now, Catch Me, is, Catch Me If You Can by Mary Cohen. Um, we've got a bit of fourth positioning position happening here on the second page on the Minamoso section, so good chance to practice your fourth position and also to to start getting in the middle of the bow, that very comfy sort of movement in, in the fingers and flexible. Make sure that the, the thumb is bent. So often when one's examining, you find there's a stiffness in the bow thumb and you know that impacts everything. So make sure that that's moving and opposite the second finger and bent. Good. Uh, now, so the next one, uh, again, another study by Mackay. This is also a really good study for developing basic double stops and some string crossing. And then we've got a mother's etude. So we're starting to get a little bit serious with our studies here. Now this, uh, again, a study with lots of attitude and lots of, uh, A minor is a great, I think, key for studies. So some terrific bowing challenges in this etude, lots of bowing strokes covered. So enjoy that one. Now we're moving on to the list B. Uh, list B for grade four. Now I'll just turn my page. 
Yeah, great. Now, so the first um, piece by Corelli, so this is our first really proper Baroque um, sonata. Now, I've, um, I've ornamented the grave as well, and I hope that you'll have a, give this a go. And so I've just done some fairly simple ornamentations. And also, I hope this is an introduction to ornamentation because the, coming up in level two, there you could even apply some of these ideas if you felt like it. So um, enjoy playing the grave. And then next, of course, one of the a very popular Baroque uh, semi-quaver movement. Now the thing is that you've got to, when you play these movements, I think talk to children about how to shape movements because it's so easy for them. It used to be called sewing machine music, so ticka ticka ticka. ticka. But it's so obvious that you follow the contour of the music and and make the phrases really be well shaped. And if you do that with dynamics, I talk about zigzag bowing often with my students. So if you start small and then get bigger and bigger and bigger as it gets louder, an example would be in, for instance, when you're moving into bar five into six. So gradually you're using more bow as you get louder. And we all know this, but you need to tell students, okay, if you want to play louder, how do you play louder? So you might need to use more bow, a little bit more arm weight, and try and start to just give them. So I've, I've marked this quite a lot, this Allegro. I've done quite a lot of um, editing of this, just to give them an idea, because originally there's nothing. So you have to give them the idea of how to make crescendos and how to then decrescendo the phrase. Now, um, the other thing, uh, the next piece in, in this uh, is the Austrian hymn, which is, again, very, very beautiful. Uh, then the waltz, yeah, the Bruno waltz. So I, I'm going to be here all day. So I think, I think it's probably time in this B. We've got a lovely recording of Melancholy Melody from Nelida Oostenbrook. So let's have a listen to that, please. Thank you. And so now um, we're going to just talk a little bit about this C. 
Um, I want to mention the first piece that I chose. The, we've got four completely different national styles here. We've got Hungarian, Celtic, Israeli and Spanish. So I hope that all of these can be enjoyed by your students. I love this first piece. Of course, we all know these famous Brahms dancers, but this is um, Watson Forbes, again, another wonderful um, music educator and violin teacher and has arranged this and it's a really good introduction to that gypsy style again and i would especially enjoy you to enjoy your students can enjoy exploring the resonance in the first um in the first line you know when this first theme comes and they're doing their vibrato they're starting to do vibrato so you know and good old b minor again and really, I, when you get to the section um, uh, around 40, 49, this section here, the Verace, and then they've got the Pule, the Poco Lento. So you can absolutely exaggerate these changes of timing. Make your student, because they never do enough, it's always just perhaps a little suggestion of getting sore, but absolutely stop, make a big deal of it, because I think that's, to feel in control and to feel you're deciding how much time and yeah so enjoy spend time on that section to get that really happening now i think that um we're going to now basically wrap up my presentation and we've got our final recording which is stephen chin now another australian composer so we're lucky to have so many australian pieces Celtic dreaming and dance. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation, Julie, and, and for running through all of those choices for the grade books and your rationale behind them and, and all of the tips that you've given over the last little while. Um, I'd like to thank once again the, the performers that have uh, recorded these demonstrations for us. That's Joe Kindamo and Zoe Black. Uh, and also Monica Kuro and Stefan Casamanos. Uh, they, they very kindly uh, recorded these demonstrations for us. And I think they're, they're something that we can all aspire to, some absolutely glorious playing um, of repertoire at that level. Um, while we've still got you, Julie, I just yeah. thought we'd run through uh, what questions that have come through, the, the questions that have come through. <clears throat> yeah. um, I'm just going to start with one that's that's pretty general, uh, and it's it's a good little discussion to have about the publications in general. Uh, grade one, list a, list a number three, bagpipes and kilts. Do we have to abide by the grey metronome mark? Uh, what do grey metronome marks mean? Um, this this tune can often be heard faster in cut common time. Would a student who played it in this way be penalised in an exam? Um, can I start? Mm -hmm. uh, so. In our publications, uh, we use a grey stippled font uh, for anything that's been added by an editor, such as Julie. Um, so where Julie may have added 
uh, accents or a, a tempo that wasn't there before or, or slightly changed the tempo for the, the purposes of an AMEB exam rather than a, a performance on a stage. Um, they appear in a gray stippled font, just to say this is, this is something that wasn't uh, put there by the composer, it was something that was added editorial later on. Those, uh, those marks can be considered suggestions. Um, they are, they're, they're not uh, mandatory at all. However, they do give you a good suggestion of what's expected at that, that level. And often, you know, a, a tempo that we would put in our books is not the absolute ideal tempo. It could be a little bit slower. Um, in recognition of the fact that the, the players at that stage are, are not technically equipped to play it really quickly or, or whatever. Um, and so, yes, those, those tempo or those, those markings can be altered, um, but then it's a, a matter of being able to make a good musical case for those. So if, if you change the tempo, you'd want it to be a tempo that makes musical sense and that the, that the player could make sense of and also uh, technically find their way around. Um, did you have anything to... Uh, Julie? No, I, you certainly wouldn't be um, marked down if you were playing it faster. Uh, yeah, because you have to give some tempo and it's very difficult because of course some students are more capable than others and often students will come in playing just far too slowly. Rarely do they come in playing quickly, but hopefully, yeah, something like this of course could go faster. As long as you're not going fast and compromising, you know, coordination, which can also happen. So, but if they can keep the pulse and go faster, that's fine. Absolutely. And uh, similarly with, with those suggested tempos, it's, it's just often a safe tempo. You know, it's, it's something yeah, that, exactly. that we can, uh, is safe for, for students technically. Um, and if you slowed the tempo down again, you know, certain things have to be done to make a slower tempo work. And if that, that students capable of doing that, then that's fine. But if it just sounds like it's slowed down because mm. the student can't get around <laughs> the yeah, instrument yeah, yeah. in time, then an examiner is going to know that. Yeah. Um, uh, could we just have a little more explanation of the intentions at level one for the list designations, list A, B, and C? Do you feel comfortable answering that, Julie? Well, well, well what I was originally told was that the yeah, level the list A was to be um, yeah pieces that were in. Um, I haven't got the exact wording here, but they were um, technically more technically based uh, pieces, basic bow strokes, etc. For um, and then list B was to be more slower pieces. Slow, a bit basically slower with extended bow strokes and this C to be alternative styles. That, that, that's roughly what I was given the brief to do, yeah. That's right. So it, the previous violin syllabus review, um, at that stage, it was decided that uh, at level one, it would be more appropriate to uh, make the designations about the technical focus of the of the pieces. Um, yeah, so rather than having you know studies and then baroque to classical and then romantic to to twentieth century, it was changed so that list A had a, a technical focus, uh, list B had a, a sort of slower, um, yeah, more uh, melodic legato. Yeah, exactly. A focus on on tone and list C is often a, a focus on on facility, um, left hand facility. Uh, as well as as alternative styles and and a, a lot of fun as well. This, it's sort of a bit I of a... I, I mean, it's trying to combine, the, like we don't have a violin for leisure syllabus. So it's sort of trying to put the two together in a way, uh, would you say, or? Oh, absolutely. So let's see, uh, it, it, we, we did go through a whole process of, of looking at the option of a violin for leisure syllabus and what that might look like and, and whether there would be different needs to cover different kinds of repertoire. Um, but certainly, especially at level one, uh, it was decided that technical grounding is technical grounding. You still yeah, need exactly. to have the same fundamentals in order yeah. to, to do uh, fiddle repertoire or, or, or yep. Celtic repertoire or whatever. Um, and so list C became the place to put those, those uh, 
alternative styles. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's that's really the designations hmm. for A, B, and C for anybody who who wanted to know. Um, again, we've had questions about the uh, recordings, the the demonstration recordings. Um, as I uh, as I've mentioned in in the previous workshop on on technical work, at this stage we're looking at other options for the demonstration recordings. Um, it's it's certainly something that we're, we're continuing to look for, but at this stage we haven't produced uh, demonstration recordings for all of the works in the grade books. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other if anybody's got any other questions, please type them into the chat now. Otherwise. Oh, somebody has typed uh, repertoire exams seem like the alternative to a violin for leisure system. Um, yes, I, I, and, and now that we have the repertoire exam option, that is an option where uh, students don't have to perform technical work as part of the examination, not that we're not expecting uh, technical work to be covered in the lessons. Um, I, I guess it does give uh, a further option for, for students who uh, would prefer different different kinds of musics and and different kinds of uh, technical work to to what we have in our comprehensive uh, exam. So we're more or less at the end of of the questions and and at the end of the session. Um, I'd like to say thanks one more time, of course, to Julie Hewison, who was the consultant for Level One. Thank you so much for all of your work over the last years, but also for the work behind putting this session together. Um, before we go, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, AMEB has launched a competition with our very generous competition partner, Glanville & Co, um, in which you or your students could win a new Glanville Daintree D20 violin valued at $2,700, Daddario Kaplan strings, and an AMEB violin series 10 book pack by answering the following question. Uh, what's your favorite piece from the series 10 violin grade books? And how would a new Glanville & Co Daintree D20 violin help you play it at your best? In one of the following formats, either written in hundred words or less uh, with an image or in a 30 second video, you can be as creative as you like. There are also three runner up prizes, which include a set of Daddario Kaplan strings and an AMEB book pack. There's a link on the screen, or there should be a link on the screen uh, that will lead you to more information about this competition. It runs until March 31st. So grab your grade books as soon as possible and start exploring. Uh, the syllabus, grade books and other resources are available now via your local music shop, via ameb.edu.au and via other online uh, sheet music retailers. Thank you once again to the AMEB Violin Syllabus and Publications team. That's Philippa Page, the Principal Consultant for the project, Julie Hewison for Level 1, Karan Chan for Level 2, and Fintan Murphy for Level 3, as well as the sight reading composers Loretta Finn and Nerida Oostenbroek, um, our typesetting and proofreading team, and the many Australian and international composers who, whose works make the grade books so very good. Um, once again, I'd like to uh, thank the performers uh, of the demonstrations today, Zoe Black and Joe Kandamo, as well as Monica Kuro and Stefan Casamenos for their beautiful renditions of the repertoire. Thanks also to the behind the scenes AMEB team, uh, Bernard de Pasquale, AMEB CEO, uh, as well as Helena Jones, Maxine Day and Alana Caldwell for making this workshop possible. And last but certainly not least, thank you to all of you uh, for attending the workshop. Uh, and for your interest in, in the new AMEB violin syllabus. Um, also to those who are watching this on YouTube uh, a little bit later if they couldn't make it to the workshop today. Um, we're really proud of the new AMEB uh, series 10 books and the, the new technical work and sight reading books. And we really hope that they serve the violin community as a useful and inspiring resource for years to come. Thank you so much and goodbye. <laughs>